No, you're okay. All right, now we're live, I think. So yesterday, we showed these numbers, um, and if you have normal vision, you see a two here, and there's different types of color blindness, so this shows what your world would look like in, in other cases, okay? Same thing down here, okay? About 5% of males are colorblind. Again, there's different types of colorblinds, but about 5% of males are colorblind. So one out of every 20. So it's not, not that uncommon at all. Girls, it's much more rare uh, because this is a sex-linked trait. We'll come back and talk about the genetics of that in a little bit. Okay? But this is what the world looks like to someone's normal vision. And this is quite possibly what the world looks like to someone who's colorblind. Okay? Uh, Andy, my son's colorblind. So as he grew up, he was, you know, we would say, go find your Dodger red sweatshirt, go find your Cyclone red sweatshirt, and he would look for something that was this color. He'd look through his closet trying to find this or this. And notice that this and this are about the same color to him. So this and this are about the same color. Okay? This is what Andy's stoplights look like. Okay? So he goes by which light's lit. And he gets by fine with that. Okay. When he was young, we owned a Christmas tree farm, operated a Christmas tree farm, which was kind of fun. I kind of miss that sometimes. But I would tie a red ribbon in the top of the green trees. And look what happens to the red in the green. Or here's the, the girl in the red dress is about the same color as the green flowers. Okay. And that was about the first time that I noticed that you know he was doing something bad with colors. It took a while to figure it out, but um, I remember playing water balloons out in the front yard. And then we you know all the balloons are broken, we'd say, okay, we gotta pick up all the pieces of balloon. And he's, I don't know what, five years old or something. And he's walking around, and he'd walk right past a big, red, broken balloon. I say, right there's one, bud. Where? Right there. Red balloon, green grass. Pick it up. You know? And I remember having an orange playground ball that got in, in the bushes. It, you know, got kicked in, in, into the bushes. He can't find the ball. He's looking right at it. I say, right there, bud. Orange ball, green bushes. Where? Right there, orange ball. You know, you couldn't see the outline of it, but there was just this orange blob in there. Orange ball, green bushes. Let's go. You couldn't find it. You know, weird. Um, so he comes home from first grade or somewhere doing his math. And at that stage, uh, you, uh, you remember doing the, your coloring math? You know, and if the answer was two, you were supposed to color it red. And if the, it was three, you colored it blue, and if it was four, you colored it green, and, and that's how you did your math, okay? And he gets, he comes home and he's got his colors all wrong, he's got his math wrong. I said, what are you doing, bud? I don't know. I said, one plus one is two. Yeah. I said, you're supposed to color it red. He said, I did. I said, that's red? He said, yeah. And it was, you know, black or green or who knows what. Um, so, I came home with this little book. I brought this thing home, and I said, Andy, do you see a number? And he's at that age where he really wanted to please. He said, yeah. I said, what number do you see? <laughs> Four. Good, Andy. Do you see a number, Andy? Yeah. What number is it? Six. <laughs> just making up stuff. <laughs> and I said, Andy's sister's watching the back. She's just laughing, you know. But. Um, Anyhow, that's when he figured out he was colorblind. And uh, can you do anything about it? Mm -hmm. Not really. You can, they do make a contact that you can put in one eye, and that changes your perception of color. I don't know how it does it, because it's not changing your rods and cones, but it changes something enough that you can interpret colors closer to what we see, what normal people see, okay? But what that means, is right now, 
Andy calls this red. When he's looking for something red, he looks for this color. And he would have to then look for something that looks like this, so he would have to relearn his colors. Right? He'd have to relearn his colors. And he's kind of figured out, and most people do, yeah, it ain't worth it, life's fine, we're getting along okay. But again, I could tell you a million Andy stories. We're, uh, we're out, when he was a little guy, we're out fishing, and he would, um, uh, he'd be off up, up the shore somewhere catching frogs while I'm putting the boat in the water, okay? And he'd come back with a frog, just a basic green frog. And he'd say, why is this frog so bloody? I said, it's not. Yeah, it's all bloody. And there was some shade of green he saw on that frog that was the same color he sees when he sees blood. Okay. Um, I don't know what other stories. Um, he, <laughs> he figured out very quickly, and, and you know, as you're growing up, who cares about colors? You know, except your teacher at school. And he learned that if he was going to color something red, he had to find a crayon that said R-E-D on it. He didn't tear the paper off his crayons. And when he found a color that said R-E-D, and he used that one, then he would get his math right, which was important to his teacher. Really, it wasn't important to him, but it was important to his teacher, you know, so, so he'd do those. Um, had a roommate in college who was colorblind, and uh, we used to tease him hard, and he didn't trust us, which was probably <laughs> wise on his part. But he couldn't tell when to stop eating watermelon, the red versus the green and the watermelon. You know, oh. and the texture's different, but the color-wise. But I remember walking out of the library with him one night, and he's walking toward the, the wrong car. It was the right model, but the wrong color. I said, Jim, that's not our car. I don't trust you guys. <laughs> probably wise for him. And uh, I said, Jim, that's not our car. Uh, yeah, it is. So he walks over, opens the door. Who stuff's in our car, you know, <laughs> you know, um, but we've had a lot of fun with that. Andy thinks he's normal and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> now, can you argue that? What's normal? And he says he's normal. There's a lot of jobs that maybe you shouldn't have if you're colorblind. Pardon? An electrician. An electrician. <laughs> it's one where you have different colored, you know, um, wires and stuff. And some of that stuff he can see once in a while. He'll ask me what color is this, but not very often. You know, not very often. Uh, but if you're a pilot kind of thing, you have all these different colored lights in the cockpit. You're expected to be able to know which light's on and that kind of stuff, and that's kind of an issue. So in the military and stuff, they kind of worry about that. He's a big-time hunter big time hunter and, and he can see camouflage stuff a lot better than I can okay and it's not a distance it's not a question of vision okay but we'll be driving we always have this little contest who can see the most deer who can see the most turkeys who can see the most pheasants and he beats me every time okay and uh, he'll just be I remember we were out we were walking in Colorado beside him when he was a little kid out by beside a trout stream he just over and says see the trout and the rest of us kind of stop and yeah, you know, the, the trout were camouflaged in the water, but he could pick them right up, you know, and I don't know what there is about that, but you can see camouflaged up very quickly. So, the genetics of this, um, I love genetics, I love hunted squares, there's not much here you need to take notes on, but it's fun to do. Remember the X chromosome is a nice long chromosome, the Y chromosome is a short chromosome. XY, is that a male or a female? Mm, X, XY is a male, XX is a female, correct? Mm -hmm. So if X, excuse me, if uh, color blindness is a sex-linked recessive trait, which means that big N is normal, small N is colorblind. I think you don't have to know notes on this, this is just for just blowing smoke here. So males, well, females can either be big N, big N, which makes them normal. normal. A female could be big N, little N, normal. normal, and called a carrier because they're carrying the gene. 
where a female could be little n, little n. Uh, little n, little n would make her colorblind. Okay? And that's about six out of every thousand. Over the years, I remember having one girl in class that was colorblind. It may have been more than that, but um, one's all I remember, I guess. Males can either be big N, nothing, which would be normal, correct? Big N's normal. Or they could be little N, nothing, which would make them colorblind. Males, because of the short Y chromosome, only have one gene, one allele for color vision. So, my vision is normal. My wife has to be carrier. So that's us. How do you know that you're normal? How do I know I'm normal? Because you're not colorblind. Because I'm not colorblind. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that could be one of our kids. What's that? Normal. Male or female? Female. Female because of the two ends and also normal, correct? And this is <coughs> a female and carrier. Can you tell by looking at a girl whether she's a carrier or not? No. There's no way of knowing just by looking at the person. So this could be one of our daughters, or it could be both. This could be one or both, or they could be one or the other. We have no way of knowing. Okay. And this is me. What is this? A uh, normal male. That's a normal son. Okay. A colorblind son. Okay. So this is Andy. And whatever. So what's kind of cool is the daughter now that's with child, heavy with child, due March 1st, okay? We'll probably get a remind here sometime that we're not gonna have class. But heavy with child. Um, we don't know if she's big N, big N, or big N, little N, but if she happens to be a carrier, what's kind of cool is her husband, Nick, is colorblind. So that's her husband. So we tease him hard about being colorblind about him too. Hmm. Um, he actually is an electrician. He's an electrical engineer. And so he has some issues with color once in a while. But, well, we do the Punnett square here. If she's a carrier and he's colorblind, okay, what's that? Carrier, female, normal male, normal male, colorblind, colorblind male, colorblind, colorblind female. So she has a 50-50 chance Do you know of if being it's a carrier. Be a girl or a boy? Pardon? You know if it's going to be a girl or a boy? Don't know if it's a girl or a boy. Okay. So far she has two sons with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. How do you tell if they're colorblind? The four-year-old kind of knows these colors. And I, there is a, there's a colorblind test for children online. And Julie and I have had this discussion and I think, yeah, she did it. And actually I get thinking I should probably take this little book home with me and play with these things, because the boys are old enough that I could say, you know, take your finger and do you see a number, and they could trace the number or something. And I think they both passed the test that, that she did. So it appears that we don't have any colorblind grandsons, but it's also possible that both of them, whoops, no grandsons, excuse me, they could both be that one right there. But it'd be I guess it'd be kind of cool to have a colorblind granddaughter, mm -hmm. unless you're the granddaughter. Would you <laughs> want to be colorblind, girls? No. Probably not. You know, you know, Andy learned real quickly, you know, 
if he was going somewhere fancy, going to a homecoming or something, and he was going to go buy clothes and tie, shirt and tie or something, he would take either his mother or his girlfriend along and they'd say, wear this shirt and this pair of pants and this tie and don't ever mix them up. You know? and, uh, and he could get by that way. But, you know, his whole life is his jeans and t-shirt, you know, so you can't really screw that up too bad. But. Comments? All right. So we talked about the rods and the cones. Um, refraction just refers to the fact that as light passes through some kind of a medium, something which changes density, the light is bent, it's refracted. They have contests where people stand in boats and shoot carp with bow and arrows. You've seen that kind of thing? You stand in a boat and shoot carp. Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're looking at fish and you think it's over here but actually it's closer to you than you think because of how the light is refracted as it leaves the water and comes up into the air so that kind of becomes an issue but this refraction then becomes a little more important when we get into the lenses and uh, anyhow let's let's talk about well let's do this one first as you look at this this is showing you the tree your lens is convex, convex lens is thicker in the middle than it is on the edges. So here's this convex lens. Mm -hmm. As you look at this convex lens, it's thicker in the middle than it is on the edges. Okay? And so light rays come through, they hit your lens, convex lenses converge light rays, so the light rays come together, and it actually hits your retina upside down, so the image of, you know, all you people out there sitting right side up, on my retina, you're all upside down, so it's sent to the brain that way, but my brain doesn't like to get messages that say the world is upside down. So what's my brain do? My brain flips it over. So you're all sitting right side up, even though the image is upside down on my retina. So what's kind of cool, then you take a special pair of glasses that flips the image over. You put those on. Now you're all upside down. But my brain doesn't like to get that message. So what's my brain do? Flips it back. So you're all sitting right side up. As long as I wear those glasses. What happens when I take off the glasses? You're upside down again. And the brain has to flip it back over. Follow that? They got kind of convoluted. It's not all that important. All right. Let's talk about myopia. Hypermetropia. If you have myopia, oh, I was going to hear, I was going to show you something else. We were talking about colorblindness. This fall, the NFL played a game with some new, uh, what do they call them, heritage uniforms or something. It was some throwback uniform. And this is what it looked like to people with normal vision. And this is what it looked like to someone who was colorblind. So if you were either a player, or if you were a fan, this is what the game looked like to you, which would be quite confusing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you look at the look at the stands, you know there's a lot of people of various colors up in the stands, but then when you go into the world that's colorblind, everybody in the stands kind of looks the same. You lose a lot of those images. So that kind of caused the NFL to think about, ooh, we need to, need to change these uniforms a little bit to make adaptions for any players that might be colorblind. Okay. All right, myopia. 
Myopia is the same thing as being nearsighted. So put your M and N together. If you have myopia, you're nearsighted, which means that you can see things that are close, you can see things that are near, but you need correction to drive. And who is that describing here? One, two, three, three of you, I would have guessed maybe more. Okay, four, five, okay. Are your parents also nearsighted? Probably so. This is a genetic trait. This is a genetic trait. And the problem with being nearsighted, what happens, this is a normal eye. If you have myopia, your eyeball genetically is too long. Let me get away from this one. <coughs> if you have myopia, this is a normal eye, okay? Light rays come in here, they hit your lens, they converge. The focal point is on the retina, so life is good. But if you're nearsighted, you have a genetic condition where the eyeball is too long from front to back. Not huge, but a little bit, okay? And because of that, then as light rays come through, they converge. The focal point is in front of your retina. So when it hits your retina, it's out of focus. Okay. The correction for this is here. So if you have myopia, Correction is to put in a concave lens. A con concave lens is one that caves in in the middle. <laughs> Keep it busy. Yeah. Concave lens is one that caves in in the middle. That's, that's your memory trip, memory trick. What's a concave lens do? It diverges light rays. It spreads light rays apart. Okay. So back over here then, here's the light rays coming in. They hit the concave lens. The light rays diverge a little bit. Not a lot, but they diverge some. It hits your lens which converges it, but the focal point is on your retina then. So those of you wearing glasses for being nearsighted, can you feel that your glasses are thinner in the middle than they are on the edges? Sure, you didn't really convince me of that. But and it depends on how serious it is. Put your glasses a little thinner in the middle than they are on the edges. All right. All the opposites are true of hypermetropia. If you have hypermetropia, that's the same as being farsighted. means you can see things that are far okay, but you need correction to see things that are up close. You need correction to read. Does that describe anybody? Okay, and you guys are kind of rare then, because this is not as common. Okay. In this case, your eyeball's too short.
this case genetically, the eyeball is too short. If you see here, here's a normal eye. And now light rays hit your lens. The focal point is actually behind the eye. It's when it hits the retina, it's out of focus. <coughs> is put in a convex lens. It's fatter in the middle than it is on the edge. We put in a convex lens. So your convex lens should be thicker in the middle than it is on the edges. You're looking hard at your glasses and nodding your head. Yeah. Cool. So you put those on when you're serious about reading or something? Okay. Is this the same as bifocals? Is this the same as presbyopia? That's my issue, right? I can see distance fine, but I can't see close as well. Am I far sighted? My image, you know, as up and through most of my life, just until the last, I don't know, 10 years or something, I could see fine. Read, I could read fine. So mine has nothing to do with the length of the eye. Mine has, my presbyopia that I have is due to the uh, lens losing flexibility, due to maturity, not age, maturity. <laughs> uh, but the, the two problems are the same. Did they ever talk about putting you in bifocals? Sometimes they will think about that instead of messing with reading glasses, they'll go ahead and put you in bifocals. We talked about that with Christy when she was just a little puppy. Bifocals on a five-year-old. All right. Visual acuity is your ability to see detail. Visual acuity is your ability to see detail. And this is measured with the old common eye chart. You talk about people having 20-20 vision. And the top number refers to you. The bottom number refers to what is normal. So if you have 20-20 vision, this means that you can see from a distance of 20 feet what a person with normal vision can see from a distance of 20 feet. Okay? Thank you for volunteering. Are you wearing contacts? Are you wearing contacts? Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Okay. Is your vision fine? Yeah. I think so, huh? All right. Cover one eye there. And can you read this line? Yeah. Sure. Can you read this line? Yes. Sure. Can you read this line? Yes. Can you read this line? Yes. Can you read this line? Give it a shot. Um. D E F E O T E C. You did fine. Okay. Can you read this line? Um, kind of. Give it a shot. Um, L, E, F. You're doing fine. Thank you. Any further than that? Um, no. No. All right. So that means that you have vision that's better than normal. You can sit down. Thank you. You have vision better than normal. You have 2015 vision which means that you can see from a distance of 20 feet what people from normal vision can see from 15 feet. So you can stand further away and see something that somebody else can stand a little closer and see. Okay, so your vision's a little better than normal, which is fine. <coughs> Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Know by the look on your face here, you were ready to volunteer. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Sure. <laughs> yeah, can barely read the E. 
That's what I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> How are we doing? Um, no, I can't read that one. You don't read that one? <laughs> no. But you do see this? It's very blurry. Very blurry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Correction in. Um, Cover up one eye. P E C F D E D F C Z Q F E L O P C D E T F O T E C Close L Z T O D F You're guessing a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you did not see the top one up there. So that's 2200. Oh, yes. <laughs> you maxed the chart. Okay. So what she's showing you is that she can see from a distance of 20 feet what the rest of us can see from 200 feet away. 200 feet is out there by the sidewalk somewhere. Can see that? Huh? Sure. Can't you read? Uh, sure. Can you read license plates out there? Sometimes. <laughs> Not quite, but the license plate are smaller than those. License plates would be about like maybe line two or three, and they're kind of dirty. Yeah, looking through yeah. the dirty window. But yeah, if if there was an E out there, it was that size, whatever it is, four inches tall, we'd be able to see it. Okay. So. When did you find out you needed glasses? In Wait a minute. <laughs> in like Are you lying to me now too? What? No. <laughs> <laughs> you. No. Remember our conversation yeah. the other day? Yeah. You do need glasses. Yeah, now I do because my eyes have adjusted to my glasses and they need them. Now they're getting worse. What? <laughs> Who told you that? that well, my parents. Because yeah. No, I didn't need glasses in the first place. <laughs> I can't. I'm not, I'm not going to share our conversation with everybody else. <laughs> but now I do because like they're struggling. They are struggling. I, I'll give you that. <laughs> Is anybody else's vision in here kind of like this 2200? My, oh I man, there's three hands. Wow. So when did you find out you needed correction? I think like third grade. Third grade. And how was third grade going for you? Um, fine. I have glasses and frails today. Okay. Um, now, are you like 2200? Is that where you are? I don't know. My thing is like negative 0.4. Your diopters? Yeah. Yeah, they, they use the term diopters instead of saying, you know, when, when your eye doctor writes your prescription, they say it's, you know, like say yeah. negative 2 diopters or something. I don't know exactly how that translates, but it, it translates into these same numbers. I know reading glasses are like negative 0.125 or something like that. Okay. Well, that's not for reading. Yeah. But for distance? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but your contacts are taking care of you. Fine. When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Put my contacts in. Put your contacts in. Okay. Can you see far enough? To see from you to the mirror and back? No. No. It's and like same way you don't either. Not really. I'm blurry. Not, not, not very well. And that's that's hard for the rest of us to understand, isn't it? You know, we can kind of squint and close your eyes and you know, but it's hard for us to understand how a person can't see from here to the mirror and back. But there's a lot of people like that. First thing to do is put their glasses on, you know, to be able to see. It would be not, not good for any of you three or four here to raise your hands to be driving without correction. Mm -hmm. That'd be awful. That'd be awful. <laughs> That'd be awful for the rest of us, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay? Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's how life works sometimes. Um, up until at second grade, then, where were you sitting in the room? In the middle, probably. In the middle? And the teacher was writing on the board. It was blurry. That's and you I mean. you couldn't see it. It was blurry. You couldn't see it. And you're thinking, why doesn't the teacher write bigger? Okay. And you thought you were normal. You thought everybody else in the room was just like you, probably. Okay. And that's that's what happens. But hopefully, a teacher in there somewhere saw you sitting there, 
doing this, <laughs> you know, and said, hey, what's the problem? Can't you see here? And you say, no, I see fine. Because you thought you could. You thought you were normal. But then somebody suggested you get your eyes tested and they figured out you couldn't see it. And do you remember when you first put on glasses? I assume yeah. you got glasses first. Yeah. Did it, it change like, your world a lot? Yeah. You go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's stuff out there. I can see the leaves now. I know. Yeah, a tree is not just this big green blob, <laughs> but it has these little things on it called leaves. And all you saw was a big green blob. Yeah. And it, it changes your world. And sometimes in second grade we call those kids stupid. But they really aren't stupid. It's just that they can't see, you know. And once they can see clearly, they become much better learners. And it's the same thing with hearing, as far as that goes too. You know? So, anyhow, comments here. All right. Um, we have what's called binocular vision. Binocular vision means two-eyed vision. Make a circle with your fingers, hold it out about arm's length away, leave both eyes open, and look at something on the wall. Okay? Now close your left eye. Is the object still there or did it jump? Okay, which eye is dominant? How do we know? Okay, so you, you make your little circle, and if it stays there, when I close my, you, know, you leave both eyes open, look through there. If it stays there when you close your left eye, then your right eye dominant. If it closes there, if it stays there when you close your right eye, then your left eye dominant. Correcto? Is your dominant eye the same as your dominant hand? No. Yeah. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Okay. Which means that if you are right eye dominant and right handed, things work okay when you shoot a shotgun because you're using your dominant eye to shoot down here. Okay. Um, if you are left eye dominant and right handed, then you'd like to be able to put your left eye across the shotgun, which means you're going to break your nose when you shoot the shotgun, you know, but it's going to come up and get you here, so you got to kind of get off to the side of it, but that presents a little bit of an issue. Where's our good softballers? Softballers? Okay. Which eye are you using as you're standing here? Or baseballers? Are you left eye dominant or right eye dominant? Right. Right? You bat right-handed? Okay. Can you pick up the spin of the ball? Yeah. And you know, you, and I'm not that level of baseball softball. We didn't ever have it when I was in high school. But um, can you see the threads? Can you? And so then you've got to translate very quickly. Here's the threads doing this way. The ball's going to do this. And so you know whether it's a curve or a fastball, or whatever, which is kind of tricky. Um, that's it takes a while to pick that up, doesn't it? Most high school baseball players do that. Most of them can. All right. But uh, anyhow. So we have binocular vision, two-eye vision, which gives you a good peripheral vision. Peripheral vision means your vision off to the sides. Standing here, I've got about, if my arms are straight out to the side, there's 180 degrees. Your peripheral vision is about 190 degrees. About 190. So if I go straight out, there's 180. I go back a little bit. I can see my fingers on both sides here. I don't see any detail. Who did I play with yesterday with the colors? Did I play with anybody with colors? Okay. And, uh, and you, know, you, you can see images over there but you can't see colors very well. You don't see sharp images, okay? But now, if I've lost one eye, now I lose all of this. Bam, there's the first time I see it. I don't see that hand over here. If my left eye is not working. So I lose all of this field. 
which becomes an issue if you're playing basketball. Let's say I'm playing center. I've got my back to the basket. I'm expected to know what's happening all around me here. And if this eye isn't working, you know, somebody over there thinks he sees me and throws the ball at me, and bang, it hits you in the side of the head. You know, because you don't see it out of your peripheral vision as you typically would. So doing something like playing basketball one eye is kind of a handicap. Okay? Reach out, you know, find it like the corner of a book or the corner of the desk. Don't go out and touch it, but just very quickly close one eye and go down and touch it. Close one eye and go down and touch it. Did you get it? You can look at it. Look at it with one eye. Close one eye and look at it. Okay? Now do it with two eyes. Are you doing better with two eyes, hopefully? Hopefully. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you volunteer? Oh, yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. You're going to hold this up in the air. Yeah. And you're going to drop it in the test tube. Why? Uh huh. I'm kind of scared. That was close. Try it again. Both one eye. One eye. Drop it in the test tube. <laughs> All right. Now two eyes. <laughs> Close. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's it's a lot easier to do it with two eyes than it is with one eye. Yeah, but because we use two eyes to judge depth. So along with binocular vision giving you greater uh, field of vision, it also allows you to judge depth. Here's the earth, here's the moon, way out there somewhere, okay? Here's the earth, here's the moon. Oh, sorry. All right, ancient astronomers, Galileo, whoever it is, I don't know where those guys were, they knew how far away the moon was. Big long tape measure and a very tall ladder? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> what they did is they would point a telescope. Whoops, I would miss the moon. Point a telescope <laughs> at the moon. Okay. At the same time, from another city on the earth, point another telescope at the moon. Okay. And they could measure, they knew this angle, they knew the distance of the side, and they knew they had that angle, angle, side, angle. And that wow. told them how far away the moon was. And they were pretty accurate with it. Now there's actually mirrors on the moon, and we can, when, when we walked on the moon, how many years ago that's been, they left mirrors, so now they can shoot a mirror out there to time the light and stuff, so it can actually be more accurate now. But that's how they did it, okay? We do the same thing with our head. Okay, if that's an eye and that's an eye and you're looking down from above at me, if I'm looking at something at the back of the room, a long ways away, my two lines of sight are nearly parallel. I don't think that's a geometry term. When my two lines of sight are nearly parallel, as opposed to looking at something close. If I look at something close, up here, now that my two lines of sight, my eyes have to converge a lot more, so you have a different angle, and your brain's able to sort that out. So with experience, you learn how much the eyes are converging, and that tells you how far away the, the object is. And like I say, that takes experience. Little kids, you take a little kid, set them right here and put a really large teddy bear out here and a very small teddy bear close to them. Which one do they reach for? Small. The big large. one. Because they think the big one's closer. They've not learned this depth perception yet. Okay? And after a while they learn this depth thing and they reach for the small one. Make sense? Mm -hmm. The problem becomes 
when you have monocular vision. If you lose an eye or damage an eye, now you don't have two lines of sight. And it's difficult to tell how far away something is. Next time you're bored, you go into the gym, close one eye, and shoot some baskets. Okay? You'll be able to get in a straight line, but you're going to have a hard time telling how far away the basket is. Okay? You're going to be long or short. If you want to challenge yourself a little more, have somebody throw the basketball at you, or have somebody throw a baseball at you, or a softball. Okay? And you're going to have a hard time telling how far away it is. I would recommend you cover up anything you don't want hurt, okay, uh, if there's a the ball at you. Same way if there's a, a car out there, okay, coming at you. One eye, it's hard to tell how far away that car is. With time, you can watch as the car moves and you can gain experience. But just in terms of getting this triangle effect, you don't get that just with one eye and that makes it difficult to judge depth. Okay. Ectolopia. Means night blindness. It doesn't mean that you're blind at night but it means your eyes are slow to adjust from light to dark. Nyctalopia, your eyes are slow to adjust from light to dark. Okay, all of us, you go to bed at night, you kind of stand in the doorway, you see the bed, you see the dog, and you shut off the lights, and you trip over the dog on your way to bed. <laughs> Right? But after you've been laying there for a while, your eyes have made this chemical change and now you can see. Correct? Don't? You just have it takes a while for that chemical change, it's called Rhodops or whatever, but wait, wait, it takes a while for that change to occur. Okay? All of us have that change, but if you have nyctalopia, it takes longer for that change to occur. Which is not an issue going to bed. It becomes an issue if you're driving at night. Okay, and so here's your car, and here's the other car. And you start out, and these cars are a mile apart. And you've been out in the dark for many minutes. Your eyes have fully adjusted, you've got your headlights on, you're seeing, life is good, off we go. But now this car starts coming at you. And it takes many seconds for these two cars to get closer together but that's a gradual change. And at some point in time, hopefully you dim your headlights, they dim their headlights, okay, so it's not quite as bright. And you get up to this point, and those lights are pretty bright. Are you supposed to be looking at their headlights? Well, you can look off to the side, kind of over here a little bit, okay? And then the cars pass each other. You're suddenly back in the dark just like shutting off the lights in the room. All of us are driving for a little while here, hoping there's nothing in the road. Okay? But if you have nyctalopia, you're driving longer, waiting for the eyes adjust from light to dark. So if you have nyctalopia, you should not be driving at night. Daytime's fine, but not at night, because it takes you too long to make that adjustment. <laughs> So, have you driven your car through a tunnel? Okay, maybe out the mountains or something. Here's this tunnel, and or here's that mountain, and there's the tunnel going through there. Let's say that it's a one-way tunnel. All the traffic's going the same way. So your car's out here. You're in the light. Okay. 
Is it possible you might not turn on your headlights before you go in the tunnel? You might get to. Right. Okay. So the DOT says we need to put lights in the tunnel to make it so you can see as you suddenly go in the dark of the tunnel. Okay. So they put lights right here. Now it's a one-way tunnel. All the traffic's going the same way. Do they put lights the same distance all the way down there? No, because that would involve a lot of lights and it'd be very expensive. So they know that when you drive through this tunnel, your eyes are going to slowly adjust from the light to the dark. And so as you get further into the tunnel, they spread the lights out. So they adjust and they don't have to spend as much for electricity. Make sense? Human anatomy teachers look for these kinds of things when you drive through tunnels. It's kind of a strange bunch, to be honest with you. But um, what if it's a two-way tunnel? If you have traffic going both ways, Good then, morning. You, then you need right. lights um, students, come to the all the way along. I am Crow, Lady Gregerson, Hunter Laird, Hannah Mark, Dalton Manor, Kayla Powers, Jordan Rasmussen. Tyler Scott, We are pretty close to being done with the eye. In fact, I think we're very close to being done with the eye. We'll do the effects of age tomorrow, and, uh, and then we'll start on the ear tomorrow. Fair enough? Thank you. No problem. She, did you shut it off already? No. Nope.